I reach over and pinch him, okay? Uh, but this is the, some believe this was a turning point, or at least a turning point in the, 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 the war for independence. Basically what's taking place is George Washington is, is his army is, is doing very, very, very poorly. Uh, General Gates has been uh, defeated, and you'll hear it in the story, but um, the British are, are, are doing very well. They're coming over the, the mountain from Tennessee into North Carolina. They've delivered a message, and their, their message is basically, uh, we're going to come over into your farms and into your, your homes, and we're going to kill all of your leaders, and we're going to burn all of your homes down. So that's basically, uh, basically the setting, and this is a, this is kind of a, I guess you'd call it historical fiction, right? So this is a, it's it's going to be um, conversational here. So um, a writer is coming over the uh, coming into the, the uh, city here, and that's how it, how we're going to pick up here. So I don't have to read the entire the entire chapter here. What's the business, Colonel? This Colonel comes over the, uh, comes into the city. From the looks of your horse, you've come a far, a fair distance at an ambitious clip, bearing news, no doubt. Yes, I must see your father immediately. We must not delay with this business. Several years earlier, Joseph's father, John Sevier, had received the rank of Lieutenant Colonel, appointed to the head of uh, the Washington County Militia in the state of Tennessee, a seasoned Indian fighter. He had defended the settlers from any an attack on the frontier. Standing in the veranda of the rough-hewn but sprawling farmhouse, Colonel Isaac Shelby quickly briefed to Sevier uh, concerning the purpose of his visit. The promise is, is Ferguson. He's talking about Major Ferguson of the British um, uh, forces. He approaches with an army of thousands. You no doubt have heard of the Waxhaws Massacre at the hands of Commander Tarleton. And surely you know by now of Cornwallis' victory at Camden. He has decimated the American troops on the southern front, fairly well sealing the British foothold in the Carolinas. The only resistance left is whatever remains of the militias in the respective states, and it's not much. My 200 men have barely stayed a day ahead of Ferguson for weeks now. So this guy's running from Major Ferguson. He's come over the the mountain and into North Carolina and he's letting them know what's going on. The Tories are everywhere. They're signing up by the thousands. These are the, the, the uh, British supporters in the colonies. They think nothing of American liberties. They will kill their fellow countrymen on sight. As far as they're concerned, the war is as good as won. Ferguson sent a message carried by a certain prisoner, Samuel Phillips, into our camps. He said this, he is marching his troops over these mountains and he intends to kill every leader of the resistance and to, to, and to burn down every home and farm in this country. John Sevier thought for a moment, oh, so it has come to this. Either we fight or we die and our families starve to death? Yes, I realize you may be out of harm's way for now, but rest assured, his armies may very well make the Holston River in five days, Colonel Shelby said quietly. Well, then we shall fight. But what do we have thus far for troops? Whatever we can muster from the county militias. Can we expect anything from, George, from General Washington? We cannot expect anything from General Washington. And General Gates' army was destroyed at Camden. <clears throat> we are the extent of the resistance now, my friend. What can we provide from Sullivan County? Sevier asked. Uh, about 250 uh, seasoned frontier fighters, all good men. I can provide about the same from Washington County. Well, may God's merciful providence attend our every move. For the next three days, the two men, known to Major Patrick Ferguson as the leaders of the over-the-mountain men, met and strategized the military defense of hearth and home. Messages were sent to, et cetera, et cetera, we'll go on. Meanwhile, Catherine Sevier's honeymoon was cut short. I didn't read that part. She was busied herself preparing new uniforms for her husband and her new stepsons, Jess, Joseph, James, and John uh, Jr. It was agreed that the troops would muster in Sycamore Shoals, 40 miles to the northeast of John Sevier's homestead on September 25, 1780, and muster they did. Entire families from the surrounding counties gathered. 
both men and boys with well-worn rifles in hand, ready to uh, go to battle. Women, children, and sweethearts were present to say farewell to their men. Never were, were more men determined to defend hearth and home. By this time, Ferguson's threats had been made had made a deep impress upon the mind of every over-mountain man and his family. These men were eager to engage in the battle. Everyone had heard the stories of the recent massacre of women and children at one of the frontier forts at the hands of a uh, British captain and the, uh, with the Indians in tow. And then there was the red coat captain. You guys all know this from uh, the, the uh, movie the, the Patriot, if you ever saw it. There was the red coat captain who had shot a, a boy in cold blood the son of a patriot in western South Carolina. Coupled with Ferguson's menace, the hangings at Camden, and the sense of brutality at Waxhaws, these over-mountain men had a clear understanding of what they must do. Colonel Arthur Sullivan and Colonel William Campbell together added 400 troops from Virginia, completing the makeshift army of strictly volunteer militia. Later that evening, the six militia leaders met for a consultation. Plans were made to march over the mountains south to Gilberttown, North Carolina. Then John Sevier addressed his fellow captains. Men, we shall not overcome our enemy except by the gracious providence of Almighty God. I am the son of a Huguenot from France. My ancestors themselves witnessed the bloodshed, the massacre of innocent people at the hands of tyrants. Today we find our opponent to be another great and formidable empire of man. Better men have lost battles to such forces. Hence I have asked that a certain Reverend Samuel Doak Presbyterian minister preached to our men on the biblical story of Gideon tomorrow morning at 7 a.m. before the march. I trust this is acceptable with my compatriots. The captains agreed on the plan, and the next morning the troops gathered in their respective companies with their families to hear this man of God preach a powerful message and intercede before Almighty God for their deliverance from the hand of the foe. Reverend Doak's final words rang forcefully through the cool mountain air. Men were stirred, hearts were ennobled to the great conflict as the parson cried out to God above in prayer. O God of battle, arise in thy might, avenge the slaughter of thy people, confound those who plot for our destruction, crown this mighty effort with victory, and smite those who exalt themselves against liberty and justice and truth. Help us as good soldiers to wield the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Upon hearing these words, the troops marched out of the camp at Sycamore Shoals and up Gap Creek, repeating that great battle cry from Scripture, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Rain poured down from the heavens as 16-year-old John Jr., 17-year-old James, and 19-year-old Joseph, these brothers, together entered their father's tent at the cap camp at Calpin. <coughs> Father, when will we see the battle for, at, uh, with Ferguson and his troops? James asked. Tomorrow, we'll march on King's Mountain. The British captain claims that he is king of that mountain, and he has said that God Almighty himself cannot remove him from it. That is the, that is the word of Joseph Kerr, who has given us the whereabouts of the enemy. This Ferguson, he is a proud man, and I believe God will bring him down. How far is the mountain? Father, his oldest son, inquired. It's about 26 miles. We're going to march at the first break of dawn. Then will we fight? Oh yes, we'll fight. And you will fight the British. Remember, sons, we fight for our home and our liberty. How do we win this battle? You remember the words of Reverend Doak? The Almighty will attend you, he said. He did not say that the Almighty may attend you, but that he will attend you. We must believe this, sons. He paused for a moment. But you know, uh, you know, you realize we have the advantage. If the British are at the top of the mountain, how do we have the advantage, his son asked. We have the advantage because we fight for our homes and the British fight for an empire. This is the difference. I want you to remember that you were raised in these hills. You were born with rifles in your hands. And I believe every one of you can shoot straighter than a military man who picks up a gun every year or so. We'll fight like the Indians. We'll move from tree to tree and boulder to boulder. Don't allow the enemy to see your face for more than two seconds. That's the two second rule. That's two counts. I know that you can aim and take a shot inside of a second and a half. I'm happy, very happy that you're here. Tomorrow you'll prove yourselves men who are able and willing to defend their homes. Tomorrow will mark a glorious day for liberty. With that, they went to bed. At 3 p.m. on the following day, 800 men marched silently towards the decisive battle 
in the American War for Independence. They were facing, by the way, uh, troops of 1,100 coming over the mountain. The men were hungry, wet, and tired. For two weeks, they had pursued Ferguson and his men through the mountain country of the Carolinas. Besides the little parched corn and raw turnips, they had little to eat in several days. But the moment had arrived. Everything was at stake in the battle. Their homes, their wives, their children, liberty, the Carolinas, America was at stake. Truly, the outcome of the conflict would be either death or victory. This day, they would fight for liberty all the way to the death. This was their commitment to a man, including 16, 17-year-old men in the battle like John Jr. and James Sevier. At the signal, John Jr., James, and Joseph joined the center columns on the east face of the mountain. Instantly, a mighty volley of shots rang out from the, were heard from the enemy. John Jr. took cover, firing in the direction of the Tories above. The charge was a difficult one. The rock-strewn hill was very steep. Trees provided adequate cover. He let go shot after shot until he could see the loyalists, av loyalists advancing on the American troops. Through the thick haze of gun smoke, John Jr. made out the movement of a Tory's bayonet sliding up his gun barrel. Before he could react, the sharp end had pierced his hand. He tripped on something on the, on the commotion as he heard a rifle shot and his antagonist uh, fell. His brother Joseph yanked him to his feet and they joined the retreat of the American troops. Taking refuge behind cover of trees near the basin of, of mountain, the American troops again returned volley for volley. Quickly wrapping his hand in a piece of cloth torn from his legging, John Jr. reloaded his rifle and set the piece for another shot. He found that he could rest the gun barrel between his left arm and knee while he took aim and pulled the trigger. Four more shots and the Americans were advancing on the mountain again. Having gained a half the distance up the mountain, again the British pressed down with bayonets, forcing a second retreat. It was clear by now the battle would be a question of willpower. The over-the-mountain men had marched 140 miles over two weeks to defend their homes and liberty, and they would not be easily resisted now. On each of the on each of the three loyalist attacks, John Jr. found himself returning to the same position under a fallen log near the bottom of the mountain. Each time he fired off another three to four shots in the Tory column. Two seconds, one, and aim, squeeze. Then he would whip back under his refuge behind the fallen tree. He couldn't help but think to himself, nobody told these, tar these Tories about the two second rule. Young John was thankful for his father's instructions. At least three times he witnessed enemy soldiers fall to his rifle shots. Each time that enemy retreated to his position up the mountain. John Jr. advanced, climbing over boulders and the bodies of wounded and dead men all the way. He could not help but notice that mostly redcoats were scattered on the fields. We must be winning, he thought, but this was no time to rest. He thought of his brothers, his sisters, his neighbors, his friends. He thought of liberty for this new nation. Every inch of ground, every bullet fired mattered now. And so the 16-year-old over-the-mountain man from the hills of Tennessee fought valiantly up the steep incline in the Battle of Kings Mountain. On the fourth advance, it was clear that the enemy was distracted and confounded by the other two advancing columns toward the south and west approach to the mountain summit. The pressure placed the eastern field on the eastern field and provided the opportunity for an advancement on the other side. As John Jr. approached the summit, he saw the, he saw the figure of Major Patrick Ferguson, this is their, their leader, attempting to abandon the field on horseback. The young man took aim and fired. At least seven other guns fired in unison, and the British captain fell to the ground. His two lieutenants fell beside him, sharing the same fate. It was at this moment that John Jr. saw his father leading his troops over the summit, firing hard as they advanced. Colonel Shelby and his men followed close behind. Minutes later, a white flag was visible from all sides of the mountain. Ferguson was dead. Of the 1,100 enemy troops, 375 were dead, and the rest were taken prisoner. The Americans sustained a loss of only 28. It's pretty amazing, of only 28 men. Okay, I want to end with this. Four years earlier, 13 colonies joined forces to face off against the most powerful empire on earth. The British Empire was flush with an almost unbroken record of military wins, political power, and unparalleled economic strength. This tremendous expansion came at the price of the ungodly slave trade, mercantilist policies, and taxation without representation. 
Seldom in the history of mankind has any people ever successfully resisted the imperialism of a rising empire and survived, yet that did not dissuade these young self-governing colonies from going to war against England, almost at the zenith of its power. During the initial meetings of the Continental Congress in the first year, in the first year of the war, this is very important right here, it's what I want to end with. In the first year of the war, Benjamin Rush asked John Adams, who would later become President of the United States, second president, I think, if they could win this contest. John Adams' reply is memorable and will resound in the hearts of free men until the end of, of history. This was his reply. Do you think we can win this war? John Adams' reply was this. If we fear God and repent of our sins. Yeah, I think we can win if we fear God and repent of our sins. And so, the Battle of Calpins. 375 dead of their 1,100 troops. 28 dead of their 800 troops. And the turning of the tide of the war. So... That's what he wanted to share with us. So it is today. We we need <clears throat> to fear God and we need repentance. That's what's needed in America. If the tide's going to be turned in our country today, that's what's needed. Without that, all is lost. May God grant us the fear of God and repentance in this country. Amen. Okay, let's get our hymnals. We're going to sing God of Our Fathers. You don't pass me a hymnal. Josiah, did you find us a number? 616. Seth isn't here to lead us, is he? No. Eric's not here to lead us? You got to keep hearing my voice. It's terrible. All right. We could throw Mark into it, but I'd be cruel right now. Caleb. Caleb can lead it. Yeah. I won't put them on the spot. <clears throat> Let's see if we can do this. Okay, does everyone know this? Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Is that, am I still on speaker? Check, check, check. Yeah. Here we go. Who's that coming in? That's Nate, okay, Nate, Nate. I'm not doing y'all, I'm just doing that. Josh could have left. Oh, he still yeah, could. Caleb was the top. No, no, Caleb's the top. 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 Oh, 
Amen. Well, let's pray. Father, we, uh, God, just want to humble ourselves before you, Lord. And we want to come to you, Lord, with grateful, and we do come to you with grateful and thankful hearts, Lord, for those who have gone uh, before us, for the which we have, for the nation that we have today. And we want to praise you and thank you, Lord, that there were those who motivated by your spirit, God, and led by your spirit and guided by your word, Lord, were willing to make the supreme sacrifice and lay down their lives in battle and risk everything, Lord, for the sake of uh, liberty, Lord, after the example of Christ who suffered and died, Lord, to make men free, free from sin and uh, death and hell and give us life eternal. God, we want to praise and thank you, Lord, for that sacrifice of so many, and we don't take it lightly. Lord, we praise and thank you for uh, bringing us here today, Lord, and we want to uh, remember, Lord, um, uh, what had to happen for us to uh, have all the the liberties and freedom that we have today. We see them um, disappearing rapidly, God. We pray that you might turn things around we seek uh, repentance, God, for our nation. We seek a uh, revival in our country. We know that it can only come from you. We ask that you bring it about for the glory of the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. We ask you bless our, our gathering the rest of this time together. Uh, bless our gathering, O Lord. Bless our fellowship. Bless the food that we're about to eat. We thank you for it, Lord. And we thank you for all the food uh, that's being eaten in the world today that no one ever bothered to thank you for. In Jesus' name. Amen.